One minute changes everything. Just as California's coastline seemed calm, scientists were jolted by an unprecedented anomaly, the kind of ocean surge no modern instrument had ever tracked. It suddenly turned familiar beaches into disaster zones from San Diego to San Francisco. With wave heights more than double the worst storm warnings and with official data contradicting every known model, the real question is not what caused these waves, but what is coming next. At 0216 UTC, a buoy stationed 22 miles off the Monterey coast registered a sudden spike in pressure. Sharp enough to trip automated system alerts, but not so large as to trigger a tsunami warning. The raw data, exported in a CSV file barely an hour after the event, showed a deviation of 1.3 millibars over a 90-second interval. The anomaly did not match any known tidal surge or storm pattern. Instead, the back azimuth calculation, essentially the direction from which the pressure wave arrived, pointed not toward the open Pacific, but at a diagonal, slicing across the expected pathways for winter swells. This directional oddity stood out as the first sign of something unusual. Inside a cramped control room at the NOAAIOOS data center, a buoy technician leaned over the live feed and annotated the data set in real time. The technician's notes flagged the spike as non-meteorological, meaning it did not correspond with any local wind, atmospheric, or tide event logged in the previous 72 hours. Instrument diagnostics ran clean, no clock drift, no battery faults, no evidence of post-maintenance glitches. The pressure sensor, calibrated just two weeks earlier, passed all internal checks. The reading remained sharp, isolated, and physically out of step with the surrounding ocean, an anomaly the team could not explain. By protocol, the technician pulled up comparative records from nearby stations. Buoy 46012 off Half Moon Bay and Buoy 46042 near Point Sewer. Both showed subtle synchronous bumps, barely one quarter of the Monterey spike, but enough to confirm the event was not a single sensor error. The anomalies lined up almost perfectly in time, forming a faint but persistent signal across the network. Cross-referencing with coastal tide gauges ruled out a rogue wave or king tide surge. The time-stamped data, plotted against forecast models, revealed a pressure pulse traveling far faster than any storm-driven swell. With the event now logged, the question shifted from instrument error to source. The technician's annotated file, marked with UTC timestamps and pressure deviation values, became the first piece of evidence for a broader investigation. No seismic event had been recorded, no underwater landslide detected, and no volcanic activity reported in the region. The anomaly's directional oddity and rapid onset left scientists with a puzzle, a pressure wave that broke the rules, arriving from a quadrant of the Pacific that should have been quiet. As the data set made its way up the chain, the isolated spike was no longer just a technical glitch. It had become the opening move in a scientific mystery that demanded answers. At daybreak, the first reports started filtering in from lifeguard towers and harbor masters up and down the California coast. By noon, the scale was impossible to ignore. Tide gauges from San Diego to San Francisco confirmed wave crests topping 14 feet in the Bay Area, with five to eight foot surf pounding beaches in Orange and Los Angeles counties. While these numbers might sound routine in the context of California's winter storms, the reach was anything but. Over 1,100 miles of open coastline faced direct exposure. For nearly 10.5 million residents living in coastal counties, the warnings meant more than just a rough day at the beach. In low-lying neighborhoods from Malibu to Pacifica, water spilled over seawalls and flooded parking lots. Lifeguards cleared piers as waves battered wooden pilings, sending spray over boardwalks and scattering crowds. The National Weather Service issued hazard statements for every major beach city urging people to stay out of the water and off jetties. In Santa Cruz, a city official described the morning surge as 
the highest water we've seen this winter. Faster, more forceful, and far more unpredictable than anything forecasted. The California Coastal Commission's flood maps lit up with alerts. In some communities, beach access roads disappeared under a shallow blanket of seawater. Power crews scrambled to restore downed lines as salt water reached electrical boxes in older neighborhoods. Surfers, drawn by the promise of big waves, found themselves facing currents too strong to navigate. At Ocean Beach, the usual crowd of thrill-seekers watched as sets rolled in, each wave breaking farther up the sand than the last. Emergency planners tracked the numbers in real time. With 1,100 miles of shoreline under threat, even a small percentage of overtopping meant hundreds of homes and businesses could be affected. In Los Angeles County alone, more than 4 million people live within a few miles of the coast. By early afternoon, dozens of minor rescues had already been logged, with lifeguards pulling swimmers from rip currents and warning sightseers away from waterlogged piers. The scale of the event was mapped out in stark terms. 14-foot waves in the north, 8-foot surf in the south, and a population at risk that stretched into the millions. For local officials, the question was no longer whether these waves were outliers, but how quickly emergency response teams could mobilize before the next surge arrived. In a quiet lab lined with sediment cores and seismic charts, Dr. Elaine Matsuda, a paleo seismologist, studies patterns left by centuries of ocean upheaval. Her work centers on the Cascadia subduction zone, a fault stretching from Northern California to British Columbia, responsible for some of the most powerful earthquakes and tsunamis in North American history. One of the most significant events in her records is the tsunami of January 26, 1700. Radiocarbon dating of buried marsh layers and tree ring analysis from coastal forests pinpoint that evening. Japanese village records show waves from that distant rupture crossed the Pacific in about 10 hours, arriving with a period and force unlike any storm-driven surge. Dr. Gyurima Sudet. Dr. Matsuda explains that while the 1700 event offers a rare window into the region's seismic past, its signature differs from what California faces today. The 1700 tsunami was triggered by a sudden, massive slip along the megathrust, a fault where the Juan de Fuca plate dives beneath North America. The resulting vertical displacement of the seafloor, mapped through sediment cores and offshore bathymetry, produced a wave train with a distinct long period rhythm. In contrast, the pressure anomalies and wave patterns now under scrutiny lack the slow, rolling onset typical of a full margin rupture. The recent signal's sharp leading edge and diagonal arrival path suggest a more localized or complex source, not a simple replay of the past. paleo records show that the 1700 tsunami left behind a single, unmistakable layer of sand and marine debris, stretching from northern California to southern Vancouver Island. The deposits average 2 to 5 centimeters thick, tapering off near the present-day Eel River. Yet Dr. Dr. Matsuda notes that the current event's geographic footprint and rapid onset do not match this historical template. The wave periods recorded by modern buoys, ranging from 12 to 18 seconds, overlap with winter storm swells, but differ from 20 to 30 minute cycles seen in paleo tsunami deposits. This distinction is critical for scientists trying to separate routine hazards from signals of tectonic unrest. Dr. Ma Dr. Matsuda cautions against drawing direct parallels between the 1700 event and the present anomaly. The Cascadia margin remains a focus of concern, but the boundary conditions have changed. Today's monitoring networks offer minute-by-minute -minute data, and they reveal a more complicated picture, one where pressure pulses, seismic tremors, and ocean currents interact in ways not fully captured by historical analogs. The search for answers now depends on collecting new field data, testing hypotheses about possible fault shifts or volcanic triggers, and mapping the subtle differences between past and present. 
for Dr. Matsuda and her colleagues, the lessons of 1700 are a starting point, not a script. The work ahead will require both the patience of a historian and the urgency of a first responder. Salt spray streaked the field station windows as Dr. Alex Rios zipped his rain shell and stepped into the wind. The morning briefing ended abruptly when the county emergency manager, Lisa Alvarez, called. Wave heights were rising, and the next set was minutes away. Rios and his team hurried to the battered pier, where a cluster of data loggers wired to pressure sensors, wave gauges, and a high-definition camera had survived the first assault. Each device held a record of the event's opening moments. Every second of data mattered. The pier trembled as another wave hit. Rio shouted instructions, his voice nearly lost in the wind, directing two techs to unbolt the main logger from its steel bracket. The unit the size of a lunchbox had started transmitting partial files to the lab, but the full resolution archive was stored inside. If the pier collapsed, weeks of baseline readings and the crucial spike would vanish. With the next crest looming, the crew worked fast. Cables were coiled, clamps loosened, the logger cradled in gloved hands as they sprinted for shore. On the sand, Alvarez watched public works crews close beach access. She scanned her tablet, tracking readings from tide gauges and flood sensors behind the dunes. The numbers had crossed the threshold, set after the 2023 winter floods. Water levels up more than 1.2 feet above predicted high tide, with waves threatening to breach the berm. That figure triggered the first round of voluntary evacuations for the closest neighborhood. A text alert pinged every phone in the zone. Within half an hour, sheriff's deputies and Red Cross volunteers knocked on doors, urging residents to pack up and head to the high school gym. By midday, Alvarez's tally showed 1,900 people had checked in at shelters across the county. Most left quickly, grabbing essentials and pets, while a few lingered to watch the waves hammer the seawall. The evacuation order, though voluntary, was clear. Conditions could worsen fast. Emergency services might not reach those who stayed if roads flooded. Back at the field station, Rio set the recovered logger on a workbench, its casing slick with salt water. He powered it up and watched as data offloaded into the lab server. The files included not just the pressure pulse that flagged the anomaly, but also the timing of each wave, temperature shifts in the water column, and subtle vibrations from the pier's structure. These raw numbers would feed into larger models, helping scientists compare this event to anything on record. Data from this unit could be decisive. As the afternoon wore on, the team attempted a second run for a tide gauge near the harbor mouth. Flood water blocked the path, debris from a collapsed boardwalk floating in the channel. With the risk too high, Rios called off the retrieval. Every piece of equipment left behind was a gamble, but crew safety came first. Alvarez updated her command post with shelter numbers and road closures, coordinating with state officials as the coastline braced for the next surge. Dr. Priya Banerjee, a USGS seismologist, loads the field team's pressure and vibration data into a seismic tomography suite, searching for patterns beneath the Pacific that might explain the sharp, diagonal wavefronts. The first cross-sections show well-known fault traces and sediment-laden canyons, but then the software flags a zone of unusually low seismic velocity, a region where waves slow down and scatter, forming what geophysicists call a shadow zone. The coordinates just west of Monterey Canyon at 36.7 degrees north, 122.1 degrees west stand out for their size and lack of clarity. The boundaries are fuzzy, the internal structure unresolved, and the velocity drop much steeper than in nearby mapped faults. Banerjee double-checks the input. All sensors passed calibration, and the timestamps align. Yet the shadow persists, defying easy classification. At Scripps, oceanographer Dr. Miguel Salazar overlays multi-beam bathymetry from last year's survey onto the new seismic models. 
The seafloor here dips sharply, with old volcanic ridges and sediment fans. But nothing in the bathymetry alone accounts for the seismic anomaly. Salazar lists the competing theories on a whiteboard, a hidden fault segment, a buried gas pocket, or perhaps a collapsed volcanic flank. Each mechanism has implications. Some could generate pressure pulses, others might simply muffle seismic waves. But the limits of the data are clear. Tomography at this depth blurs features smaller than a kilometer, and velocity uncertainties run as high as 15% in these shadowed regions. Banerjee and Salazar agree, the evidence is puzzling, the imaging incomplete, no single source fits all the observations, and the seafloor's story remains unresolved for now. Dr. Priya Banerjee stands before a wall of real-time seismic readouts, her attention fixed on a single term, precursor wave. In seismology, this label carries weight. A precursor wave is a short-lived, sharp pressure pulse that sometimes arrives hours or days before a major seismic event. It's rare, and its appearance in the data triggers debate at every level of emergency management. Banerjee argues the recent pressure spike and its diagonal trajectory match the criteria, abrupt onset, cross-network confirmation, and no meteorological or routine seismic explanation. According to the state's alert protocol, a confirmed precursor wave can trigger a statewide warning only if certain thresholds are met. Wave height, duration, and velocity must all exceed historical benchmarks. At the California Office of Emergency Services, Chief Safety Officer Mark Treadwell reviews the alert matrix. He points to the protocol's gray areas. The current spike is sharp, but short. Its amplitude just below the automatic warning line. Treadwell cautions against overreacting, noting that false alarms can erode public trust and cause unnecessary panic. The debate intensifies as Banerjee insists that, with millions living in flood-prone zones, waiting for further evidence could cost precious time. The policy dilemma is clear. One side sees a textbook precursor demanding urgent action. The other weighs the risk of mass evacuation against the possibility of a false positive. With no clear consensus, the decision hangs in limbo, even as new ecological signals begin to surface along the coastline. On the northern stretch of Monterey Bay, a crowd gathered where dozens of gray and common dolphins had washed ashore overnight. By sunrise, local volunteers and marine biologists from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute were working side by side, logging species and noting the timing of each stranding. Dr. Rena Morales recorded the incident as the largest single-day marine mammal beaching in this region since 2017. The animals showed no signs of entanglement or injury, just confusion and exhaustion. Their bodies were scattered along a quarter mile of sand. Further south, tide poolers reported seeing deep water squid and lanternfish near the surface, species rarely encountered outside of submarine canyons. These sightings, logged in the California Current Anomaly Database, coincided with the pressure pulses detected offshore. Still, not every scientist is convinced the timing proves a direct link. Dr. Calvin Lee, an independent geophysicist, cautions that animal behavior can be triggered by a range of factors, chemical changes, temperature shifts, or even subtle vibrations undetectable to human instruments. He stresses that while the biological signals are striking, peer-reviewed analysis is still pending. For now, the only certainty is uncertainty. The Pacific remains restless, and the search for answers continues without consensus. Today, California's coast faces new uncertainties, as scientists warn that high surf and shifting Pacific patterns may foreshadow larger risks. With over 27 million people living in coastal counties, every anomaly demands our attention. Nature's signals rarely arrive with clear warnings, and readiness now means resilience later. The future of these shores depends on what we choose to heed and when. Stay alert and share your thoughts below.